Hey everybody, this is great. We've got another question for us uh, that, that someone asked. Oh, this is a, a group of people asked this question, or it's not really a question, it's just more like, well, it seems like the way that it was proposed to me was just talk about this thing. So what is this thing? To talk about the prophecies of the end times. Um, so so we, this is a fascinating thing that <clears throat> as the gospels get closer and closer toward their end, um, especially toward like the end of Jesus's public ministry. So we, we know that uh, Jesus kind of finishes his public ministry and then he enters into the last you know, day and a half of his life, which would be like the, the end point or the beginning of, of this sort of private thing that he does at the end of his ministry would begin with the Passover meal, uh, the Last Supper, ultimately, uh, where, where he, you know, takes bread and he gives it and, you know, he washes his disciples' feet and that kind of thing. And you could read about that in like basically the last three chapters of, of all four Gospels. Uh, so uh, Matthew chapters 26 through 28 would be the passion narrative with the resurrection. Uh, Mark chapter 14 through 16 would be the passion narrative and, and all that goes with it uh, with the resurrection. Uh, Luke 22, 23, and 24. Uh, John is the last four chapters. Um, but, you know, even like the Last Supper goes goes actually even further back. I think that would start with like John chapter 13. But specifically, like the passion narrative would begin um, with, with John... Um, 18, 19, 20, 21, you know, th those, those four things. So anyway, so you could read that actually, and that could actually be really fruitful to just read the different uh, perspectives on those passion narratives and uh, to see how, you know, what, what things the each author wants to emphasize, um, you know, the different things that they record Jesus to be saying. And, and you can overall get this this picture of Jesus laying down his life uh, and what, what goes on there. And then of course, get this picture of the resurrection and, and what that must have looked like, you know, the, the joy of it. Anyway, so, so before Jesus gets to that point, um, especially in the synoptic gospels. The, so the synoptic gospels are Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Uh, they're, they're synoptic because they're written like a synopsis. So in other words, it's, it's more, more of a narrative. John is, is maybe more of a, a upper, upper level, kind of bigger picture. So in, in fact, if you ever see images of, um, like if you have a, a book of the gospels and it has different animals on the front cover, usually there's four animals. Uh, one of them is a man, one of them is an ox, one is a lion, and one is an eagle. John is usually the eagle. Well, he is is not usually he is the eagle why because he looks at everything from like a bird's eye view um he soars above the rest we could say uh in his writing and that doesn't mean that he's not writing truth or that he's not contributing to the narrative it's just that he's he's writing from a much more um you know a theological lofty kind of perspective um so anyway so th that's kind of a neat thing but anyway so matthew mark and luke are the the synoptic synoptic gospels and in those jesus will talk about the end of time and then just kind of leave it at that, actually. And, and then, of course, we know that time hasn't ended because, well, here we are watching this video or I'm making this video. And, and so that's kind of a strange thing. So let's, let's dive in. So I want to look at a couple of these um, prophecies, I guess we could call it, from Jesus. So Jesus, uh, it, you know, in my mind, I guess it sounds weird to call them prophecies, but Jesus is a prophet. He's a priest, a prophet, and a king. So it is a prophecy from Jesus that he's talking about. So I want to begin with Luke chapter 21, uh, verses 5 through 19. So it's a little bit of a longer one, um, but I just want to read through that. So let's, let's see here. And as some spoke of the temple, how it was adorned with noble stones and offerings, he said, As for these things which you see, the days will come when there shall not be left here one stone upon another that will not be thrown down. And they asked him, Teacher, when will this be? And what will be the sign when this is about to take place? And he said, Take heed that you are not led astray. For many will come in my name, saying, I am he, and the time is at hand. Do not go after them. And when you hear of wars and tumults, do not be terrified, for this must first take place, but the end will not be at once. Then he said to them, Nation will rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom, and there will be great earthquakes, and in various places famines and pestilences, and there will be terrors and great signs from heaven. But before all this, they will lay hand, their hands on you and persecute you, delivering you up to the synagogues and prisons, and you will be brought before kings and governors for my namesake. This will be a time for you to bear testimony. Settle it, therefore, in your minds not to meditate beforehand how to answer, for I will give you a mouth and wisdom which none of your adversaries will be able to withstand or contradict. You will be delivered up even by parents and brothers and kinsmen and friends, and some of you they will put to death. You will be hated by all for my name's sake, but not a hair of your head will perish. By your endurance, you will gain your lives. 
Okay, this this is great. In fact, we could we could even keep keep reading actually because he, he you know he talks about like Jerusalem is going to be surrounded by by armies and there's going to be this great tribulation, this great distress that that comes upon the earth and wrath will come upon the people. Um, like there, so anyway, so th this is something that happens uh, that that he's talking about. In fact, in another one of the gospels, it might be I don't remember if it's Matthew or Mark, but Jesus is coming out of the temple and his disciples say, "Look at these marvelous stones." In other words, looking at, look at this grand building that that we've we built, you know, in in the name of God. And Jesus says, "The day will come." when there will be not be left one stone uh, up on, on top of another. In other words, he, he predicts, he prophesies about the destruction of the temple. So anyway, so, so a person could, could read this and, and say, okay, well, um, what, what's, what's the deal? And like, when is this going to happen? And what does that look like? And, and for that matter, I, I look at the world now, and what do I see? I see nation rising up against nation. I see, I, I see this, this grand apostasy from the faith. Apostasy means people abandoning their Christian faith, their Catholic Christian faith. I see that happening. I see uh, famines. I see pestilences, terrors, and great signs. It seems like they're, they're coming from heaven. Um, and, and what's more, people are being persecuted. You know, so, so um, you know, in the United States, we could talk about whether Christians are really being persecuted in the United States. It's, it sure seems like it's possible that things could go in that direction. Um, you know, it's, it's it, if not a, a, a physical persecution, it sure seems like there's a like a psychological persecution that takes place, um, you know, for anyone who wants to truly remain faithful to what the gospel teaches. You know, that, that seems like it happens. But we also know that in other parts of the world, there's like serious like martyrdoms taking place. In, in the country of Nigeria, for example, uh, Christians are experiencing severe persecution, like execution, simply for being Christian. Uh, for, for professing to believe in Jesus. They're, they're being killed for that uh, and, and kidnapped and that kind of thing. And that's not, it's not just in Nigeria. It's happening, you know, in different places throughout the throughout the world. Um, and so it's like, okay, well, that seems like that's happening. So what, what's the deal here? So I think I think there's a couple of things to point out. So first, what's Jesus um, prophesying? So he says that there will not be one, there will not be left here one stone upon another that will not be thrown down. So he's prophesying specifically about the destruction of the temple. So we, we want to read this and we, you know, like this, this can maybe be a temptation that we experience that when we, every time we read the Bible, we immediately want to do what we immediately want to apply it to our lives. Like, how does this apply to my life? And so in some ways it makes sense to say, okay, well, I want to read this. And Jesus is prophesying about what seems to be the end times. And, and so I want to apply that to my life and say, like, am I, am I living in the end, living in the end times? Like, is, is this it? Um, when it, when in fact, um, Maybe that's not a bad thing to do, but maybe the first thing we should actually do is say, is there an immediate context that Jesus is speaking into? Immediate meaning something closer to him, like like, not just closer to him, but like in in that time period, that very time period. And, and to be sure, we know that's the case, actually. So Jesus, what? He starts his ministry when he's 30 years old. He finishes his ministry when he's 33. And then he's crucified, of course, risen from the dead, stay, hangs out for 40 days, and then he ascends up into heaven. So it's, you know, around, you know, the, the, they're not sure about the timing, but around 30 AD, somewhere somewhere in that range. And, and we also know that the temple was destroyed in 70 AD. So just 40 years after, after Jesus lived on this earth. So here he's prophesying about the temple being destroyed and about the end times or what's going to come during that time. And 40 years later, this is what takes place. So again, people want to read this and be like, okay, well, I'm seeing nation rise against nation. And I'm seeing, I'm seeing the famines and the pestilences. And, and it's like, okay, that, that is happening in our time. But to understand like, like the immediate fulfillment of what Jesus is talking about, it already took place uh, where the temple the, the, the temple, which is the dwelling place of God. This is, this is the place where the Jewish people could go and know that like, this is where God dwells among us. Uh, and, and not just that, but it is the one place where the Jewish people can offer sacrificial worship. They, they don't offer sacrificial worship anywhere other than in the temple. That's the only place because that's, that's all that the law, the Torah, the first five books of the Bible, is all the law allows and commands for that matter that they could only offer sacrificial. So, so Jewish people now, you know, like we have synagogues still and they can meet in their synagogues for, for, for you know, Bible study, for preaching, for prayer, uh, for a kind of worship, but not for sacrificial worship because the temple has been destroyed. And then, and then what's more, there, there's this, this sort of um, remote fulfillment or this, this remote aspect that is the, like to say that the temple, it's like an image of, of the cosmos. So a microcosm, we could say, it's like a small little image of what everything is is meant to be so in the temple is 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 like a little bundle of of the universe 
So in, in a kind of way, when we see the destruction of the temple, you know, 40 years after Jesus dies um, and rises and ascends into heaven, 40 years after we see the destruction of the temple. And so it's like, okay, well, I know that because that temple was destroyed, I know that the world is going to be destroyed. But, but maybe not in the way that I anticipated that it's going to be destroyed. Um, that, that actually, you know, the book of Revelation talks about how there's going to be a new heaven and a new earth. Uh, that is going to come when Jesus comes again in the, in the second coming, what we call the, the 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 universal judgment of the nations, which he talks about in Matthew chapter twenty five. So I, I, again, I think I think it is true that Jesus is going to come again. Oh, I don't I don't think it is. I, it is true that Jesus is going to come again. We know that's true because the Bible talks about it. Um, but but to understand that that it's not like like yes, there there may be signs, but what what's really tricky is when we try to figure out when he's coming. Um, in fact, in, in uh, the Gospel of Mark, Jesus makes very mention of this. So Mark chapter 13, verses 32 through 37, Jesus says this, But of that day or that hour, no one knows, not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son, but only the Father. Take heed, watch and pray, for you do not know when the time will come. It is like a man going on a journey when he leaves home and puts his servants in charge, each with his work and commands the doorkeeper to be on the watch. Watch, therefore, for you do not know when the master of the house will come in the evening or at midnight or at cock crow or in the morning, lest he come suddenly and find you asleep. And what I say to you, I say to all, watch. So th- th- something really, really important here just to point out is that, that like, yes, the, the, the world will end. Whether that happens during our life or, or after our lives are over, the world will end. Jesus will come again. But whenever we try to figure out the, the timing of it, um, we're, we're going astray. That, that's the thing. It's not, it's not something that's meant to be figured out. In fact, sometimes, sometimes you'll see this. Preachers will come along from time to time and say, you know what, I've, 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 I've looked at the Bible and I found this secret code and, and I know that it's going to happen it's going to happen on this particular date. In fact, I remember a few years ago, this guy, um, what was his name? Howard Camping or something? His last name was Camping. I don't remember what his first name was. Um, Walter Camping, whatever, it's not important. Uh, he predicted that on a particular day of a particular year, the world was going to end. And I was in seminary at the time. And, you know, like some people were getting really worked up about it, actually. Some people were, were spending their entire life savings, uh, not in the seminary, but around the country, were, save, were using their entire life savings to like buy billboards, to, to warn people, to tell them to, to get ready for the coming of Jesus. And um, it's funny, at, at the seminary, I we had little name tags. And um, I jokingly, I, I wore my name tag that day so that, you know, like, when Jesus came and was sifting through all the dead bodies, the charred bodies, he could see my name tag so he could at least know who I was. Um, I texted that some, to some friends and they didn't think it was very funny. Uh, anyway, so so like that's that's like, okay, this guy tried to figure it out. And what happened? Well, that day came and it passed. And then he's like, oh, I think it's, you know, it's, I was off by a few months. And then that day came and then it just passed. You know, so like anytime we try to figure it out, it's, we got to remember like, no, Jesus says like, no one knows. No one knows the date. But, but but the purpose of not knowing the date is not not so that we can be caught up in anxiety, but so that we can understand that the purpose isn't isn't so much like I got to get ready for that day. As, as yes, I want to be ready for that day. But the purpose is to say I want to be ready all the time because to be a disciple is to live a disciplined life. Right? Same same root word there. To be a disciple is to live a disciplined life. And so if I'm, if I'm just looking for like one particular day or, or if I'm trying to look at the signs of, of the world that are going on, and yes, like it can seem like some of the signs in the world are matching up with what's in the Bible. And, and that very well may be a sign that, that, G, that God is calling us to prepare. But you know what else is a sign that is calling us to prepare? Is the Gospels. Because Jesus says to us, watch, stay awake, stay alert. Like, like this is the thing. Don't, don't get, in fact, the message of the gospel so many times is like, don't get so caught up in the world that, that you lose sight of me, but instead keep your eyes fixed on me. Because why? Because heaven and earth are going to pass away, but my words will not pass away. And so, so to understand that, that yes, Jesus is going to come. And, and so we want to prepare for that, but also to understand that even if he doesn't come during our lives, we're going to die because that's, that's the one thing that happens to all of us is that we die. And, and sometimes people die unexpectedly. And gosh, what a shame it would be if a person died unexpectedly thinking, well, I'm just waiting for the second coming of Jesus. And so that person isn't actually ready for the Lord. You know, like what, what, a, what a shame that would be where a person said, I still got time because Jesus isn't coming again. No, like how about, how about we just prepare that 
in such a way that we could all die at any given moment. And so I want to be awake. You know, even as I share this, I'm being convicted a bit here because uh, like, well, I, I got I to gotta get ready. You know, I got to be ready because um, I don't know that I'm ready right now. Uh, and so this is, is the gift, actually, that I get to talk about this. You know, I was thinking about this. I, I watched a whole bunch of um, YouTube videos in a, in a good way about this topic before before making this video. And it's just like, man, I'm really convicted right now. I just I want to be ready because because Jesus is going to come and, and he tells us to be awake. Uh, what, what do we call this this coming? This coming is called the parousia. Parousia, it's a Greek word that means coming. Uh, in Latin, it translates to adventus, which, what does that sound like? Adventus sounds like Advent. So what the season of Advent is all about is, is preparing for the second coming of Jesus. We know that it ends at Christmas, but, but the purpose of the season of Advent is not to get ready for Christmas. The purpose of the season of Advent is to get ready for the second coming of, of Jesus. Um, he was he was born and he came the first time in the incarnation at Christmas, um, but that's that's an image of of what is to come that he's going to come again. The first time he comes in humility in disguise we could say. The second time he's going to come in glory not in disguise, uh, but he's going to come in glory to to judge us. And so we, we want to be ready for that. And and so we actually we we want to as he says we we want to stay awake. We want to watch for that day. Um, in fact, St. Saint, Saint Peter, we'll talk about this. St. Saint, Saint Peter, in the second letter of St. Peter, let me see if I can find it here in my Bible. The second letter of St. Peter, chapter 3, verses 8 through 14. I want to read these verses because I think they're just really good. But do not ignore this one fact, beloved, that with the Lord one day is as a thousand years and a thousand years as one day. The Lord is not slow about his promise as some count slowness, but is forbearing toward you not wishing that any should perish, but that all should reach repentance. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief, and then the heavens will pass away with a loud noise, and the elements will be dissolved with fire, and the earth and the works that are upon it will be burned up. Since all these things are thus to be dissolved, what sort of persons ought you to be in lives of holiness and godliness, waiting for and hastening the coming of the day of the Lord, because of which the heavens will be kindled and dissolved, and the elements will melt with fire, but according to his promise, we wait for new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. Therefore, beloved, since you wait for these, be zealous to be found by him without spot or blemish and at peace. This is so good. And it even goes further, actually. So I guess I'll read verse uh, the first part of verse 15. It says, and count the forbearance of our Lord as salvation. So this, this understanding of like, okay, the Lord has taken a long time. It seems like, you know, 2000 years. For him to come again and gosh it's like okay lord you could come anytime you know like how about how about it you know like wouldn't it be great um if, if you just came and we were already and and uh and you know we could we could just get this show on the road you know we can enter into our eternal glory like with you what a gift that would be and, and yet what does what does peter say he says actually like no with the lord one day is as a thousand years so in other words his timing is just different it's just different so we, we think of it as being two thousand years but the lord he works outside of time and so so for him it's not two thousand years in a mysterious kind of way um, he works outside of time, and so his timing is just different. And and part of the reason that that it seems like a long time actually is is what is is um is is not that he's slow, but that actually he he desires that no one should perish, but that all should reach repentance. So why why does he wait? Why does he delay his coming? Because he's waiting for our repentance. And and that you 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 know if you're watching this video you've probably repented if you're still watching this video you've probably repented hopefully you have, um, and and hopefully I have in fact I, I know that I I'm due for confession and so I, I plan on going soon, um, but but the thing is that there are plenty of people who have not repented, uh, plenty of plenty of a seemingly faithful Catholics even who have not repented, and and the Lord is just waiting for that. And it's not to say that like he's he's not going to come until everyone has repented. It's but but his delay or what seems to be delay for us is is for the sake of giving those people more opportunities, more more time to repent. In other words, he's like, no, I, I want to wait just a little bit longer because maybe maybe you know. And of course, the Lord knows all things in in, in his timing. But but at the same time, you can get the sense of like, well, he's a father who, who loves his children, and so so you can imagine like a father. You know, they think of, think of the prodigal the prodigal son, his father. Um, what the father is looking for his son to return, even though his son is, is basically like spit in his face in Luke chapter 15. The, the father is looking so that when he sees his son coming from afar, from, from far off, what does he do? He runs to him. Like this is, this is like the God, the father's perspective is like, I could, I could end the, I could end the world right now, but I'm waiting because I'm looking, I'm looking for my prodigal son and my prodigal daughter, hoping that, that he will repent, hoping that she'll turn from her sins. 
Um, that's what he desires. And so, so in the meantime, what, is, what does he say? Since all these things are thus to be dissolved, what sort of persons ought you to be in lives of holiness and godliness, waiting for and hastening the coming of the day of the Lord? So, so to live a holy life, a holy life, what does that mean? To live a life that is set apart, that looks different than the life of, of the world. To not get caught up in, in worldly things in such a way that they consume you, but, but instead to live a life that is holy, that is godly, actually. And St. Paul, or St. Peter, actually, strangely, he says that, that as, as we wait for the Lord, the day of the Lord, as we live a life of holiness and godliness, what, what happens? We, we hasten, we hasten the day of the Lord. Like some, something strange happens there that as, as more and more people jump on board with the gospel and, and become disciples of Jesus, there's something that happens there of, of like we're showing the Lord that, that more people are ready for him. And perhaps as more people are ready for him, singularly devoted to him, what might happen? Well, he might come like a bridegroom, because, because his bride is, is, is waiting for him, waiting for the bridegroom to come. And so if we're all waiting, then, then maybe he'll come. You know, so I, I think that's cool. There's, there's a few other passages we could look at, uh, you know, where St. Paul talks about the, the final judgment. He talks about um, how we all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. Uh, you know, he says that in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, talking about this particular judgment, um, you know, that, that we're going to be judged according to what we do in the body. So in other words, we're going to be judged for eternity according to how we live our life here on, on earth in the body. Um, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 is going to be a really great chapter to look at. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, where Paul, you know, like he, so he mentions it and then he kind of follows up on it. Um, um, in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 uh, with, with a little bit more. You know, so there's there's more we could talk about. You know, one other thing I wanted to mention is sometimes people, um, I, I know lots of people who will get uh, really worked up about this this thing called the three days of darkness. Um, so this is not biblical. This is this is something that, that some of the saints have, have devotion toward. Um, this three days of darkness thing. So so what is that? That um, I don't I don't fully know. I haven't I haven't studied it, but uh, people will well, say like Saint, like Padre Pio, who was a, a priest, a holy priest. He he lived, was a holy priest. He lived in the he died in the 1960s, and he had this image of you know at the end there's going to be three days of total darkness, total darkness, and the only light that will come is is from these candles that will be that people will burn in their houses, and they're they're apparently going to be demons or something that that come to people's houses and you know like try to try to speak to them and and convince them to come out of their house, and so people are just like okay they're really worried and nervous about this, and and my perspective on that is. Is that um, that might that might happen? That may very well happen. You know, Padre Pio is a holy man. I don't want to doubt his his uh, private revelations. Um, but the point that I always say is, um, how about we just live ready here and now, so that if even even if we we get seduced by the devil into a place where we're going to be tempted or abused by him, if we just remain faithful, if we just live a disciplined life in Christ, then even even if we are in a place of temptation. Because we're disciplined, because we're, we're, we've allowed the grace of God to become active within us, because of that, we we won't get lured into it, you know. Um, or, or you know, we see the different things going on in the world, the different problems that we have, or the, the people who have abandoned the faith, um, the things that seem like they're biblic, you know, like we're living in biblically uh, biblical times. Um, we, even those, we don't have to get so caught up in them that that they actually. Because what can happen is if we get so caught up in them, we, we can be driven to despair or we can uh, be driven to madness, you know, that kind of thing. But instead, if we just live a disciplined, steady life, a life that is focused on Jesus, Christ, and his church, a life that is actually even focused on, like, trying to share the gospel with people, taking a risk in faith of, of, of sharing the gospel with people, so that what? So that maybe some of those people that we share the gospel with, maybe not everyone, but some of those people, they might what? They might be brought to repentance. They themselves might be brought to a place where they say, I, I got to get ready for the Lord. And what does St. Peter ha say happens when a person turns from his sinfulness toward a, a life of holiness? What happens? We're hastening the day of the Lord. We're actually, we're showing the Lord that more and more people are, are ready for him, ready for his return. And, and what a gift that will be. So I, I want to encourage you in that of, of like, to not, like, yes, it's, it's good for us to be aware of what's going on in the world, I suppose. But even then, I just really encourage you to not get so caught up in, in the politics of the day. Don't get so caught up in, in the wars of the day. Um, don't get so caught up in, in the, the news that, that, it, that it takes your eyes off of Jesus, that it distracts you from your one true purpose, which is to live a life of godliness and righteousness. That's, that's so important for us uh, to keep in mind. And, um, and, if, and again, that doesn't mean we can't pay attention to those things, but it's if those things get lead to like our minds being consumed with with thoughts about those things rather than being consumed with thoughts about Jesus then then we need to we need to repent of that and actually come back to the Lord and uh and to, to not 
let anything rob our peace, you know, uh, to not let anything rob our peace. St. Teresa of Avila said this. This should be the last thing. She said, uh, nada te turbe. So in, in Spanish, I don't speak Spanish, but I know the phrase, nada te turbe. Let nothing disturb you. Let nothing disturb you. God alone suffices. So, so, and, and, and this is, this is the good news of the gospel is that we have access to God all the time. And, and if we've uh, committed a mortal sin, well, the good news is that we have access to the, the grace of God through the sacrament of re reconciliation. And so even then we have access to God. Uh, so let nothing disturb you. Yes, we can, we can be concerned about things in the world. We can be concerned about the news, about the, 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 the things that seem to be signs of the times, but let nothing disturb you and just remain faithful to the Lord. Uh, and if you remain faithful to the Lord, then he'll remain faithful to you. Even if you aren't faithful to the Lord, he'll remain faithful to you. Um, but but your judgment will be less favorable. So how about we just we just seek to be true disciples of Jesus, engaging in a life that is focused on on the the devotion to the apostles' teaching through reading of the Word of God and the the study of, of what the church teaches, through uh, fellowship, which is such an incredibly important thing, through the breaking of bread, the Eucharist, to have a devotion to that, and then to a, a devotion to the prayers. Acts chapter two verse forty two, super important. So there we go. I hope this is helpful for you. And uh, if you have any further questions about this topic, about other topics, by all means, leave a comment. Uh, find a way to reach out to me. I'm, I'm happy. I love making these videos. And um, uh, as long as they're helpful for you, I'm, even if they aren't helpful for you, they're actually helpful for me. So there we go. A <laughs> little bit of selfishness. God bless you. Have a great rest of your day. Peace.